one of the things that I've discovered in this country and in many parts of the world, if you are a honest man, the likelihood of you are falling victim to corruption is very high. Because people who are honest are also very naive. Thieves are normally very calculating, very organized, and they know how to do things which will undermine you before you know. That is why prevention is therefore very careful. We must produce and have systems which are instituted to ensure that as much as possible corruption is the exception other than the rule. The problem in Africa, in many African countries, is that corruption is the rule rather than the exception. Corruption exists in every part of the world. But the truth in many parts of the world is that it is the exception other than the rule. That is what we in the African continent and you in the labor movement, because you are men and women of influence, sometimes you do not know the power that you have. This is the problem that you have. But if you appreciated the power that you have, even in your little spaces of organization, and you who are the top echelon of the labor movement, your power is immeasurable. If you raise your voice, if Brother Atoli here raises his voice, the head of state will have to listen. Do you think when President Kenyatta came here, he came here just because like that? No, he knows your power. He knows your power. Don't take it for granted. He knows that 54 countries represented here. You can shake this continent. And how do you use that power in a creative manner? It is William Shakespeare who said, that it is good to have the power of a lion, but it is dangerous to use it like a tyrant. When you have power, you must be humble and you must use it for the general good because you are protecting workers and you want to ensure that workers' salaries have meaning. You know, I was in Austria last year and I was speaking passionately why people should go back to Africa, move out of Europe, and go back to their countries. And during the question time, a young girl from Zimbabwe told me, I hear you. I want to go back to my country. But tell me, I'm a doctor. When I left Zimbabwe, my salary was the equivalent of $50 per month. And I did not get it every month. Should I go back? I said, no, don't go back. Because you've got to be realistic. In as much as we want to be idealistic, between now and the day she retires, that girl has to educate her children. She has to leave. And you who are in the labor movement must also know that corruption erodes the real value of the salary. And when the real value of the salary is eroded, all of us are good and are wearing suits and all the tunics we have here because we have had breakfast. And because we're sure we'll have lunch. And because we are sure we'll have dinner. And because we are sure we'll have shelter. And because we are sure we'll go to our countries. And because we are sure we'll have all those things. If today you are told that you lose all those things, another side of you which we'll never see will come out. <laughs> Dignity of a human being is only possible if certain basics are provided. And I'm submitting to us that corruption takes away our dignity. And that is why, therefore, in addition to prevention, when people engage in corruption, there must be consequences to corruption. You know, when President Buhari of Nigeria in his first term came with uh, all these ideas about fighting corruption, urging the FC, FCC to go on, when President John Pombe Magufuli started doing that in Tanzania, here in Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, but I want to focus on Buhari. There was a group of people who were demonstrating somewhere in Lagos, let corruption come back. <laughs> because corruption can become a way of life and you define your lifestyle through corruption so that when it goes away, you actually want it to come back. Because let me give you an example. If your salary is $1,000, and meanwhile you have three children, each of whom is paying $1,000 school fees, and you are building, and you have children in the United States, and you are de driving a designer car, a Bugatti, and we take away your 
illegitimate income, which was $10,000, and we leave you with your $1,000, you will kill us. Because corruption now defines your lifestyle. And when corruption defines people's lifestyle, then they become very prote protective of that corruption. And that is why you must hurt people where, you must hit people where it hurts most. So, in my view, it is incumbent upon us to recognize that corruption is dangerous. But I must also remember one thing, that in the letter of invitation, I was told that I will give a short presentation. <laughs> and I've already covered some ground, and I now want to wind down. Knowing as I do that my good friend, Professor Manyora, is here, and that we'll have an occasion for interaction, let now ask ourselves very specific question. In what ways that corruption impeded the growth of Africa in the last few years? Let us look at different sectors. Let us ask ourselves in the area of agriculture, how has corruption continued to impede our growth in agriculture? Africa still produces primary goods. Look at the whole of West Africa. The greatest producers of cocoa, you go to Cote d'Ivoire, you go to Togo, you go to Ghana, these are producing cocoa. But who produces the chocolate? The Switzerland, who does not have even a single tree of cocoa? What will they do? It is only yesterday that I saw there's somebody in Togo who is now packaging cocoa, and I know that in Ghana they are also beginning to move from the, from, the, from the field to the chocolate bar. Good development. But that is only a drop in the ocean. There will be people who will bribe you, even you in the labor movement, to ensure that Africa continues to focus on raw agriculture. There will be such people. There'll be people who are telling us, grow for us avocado and export it to us and then we'll return it to you. And there is that that is going on. Africans are being told, grow avocado, avocado, we need, we have great appetite for avocado. And we are telling our farmers, grow avocado. <laughs> and then we export it raw. Let us ask ourselves what we would do if we reduce corruption in agriculture and Africa were able to feed ourselves. Because history has demonstrated as long as you can't feed yourself, you can't grow. In fact, if you can't feed yourself, you can't even think. I urge you, if you doubt me, just uh, have a dry fast until the evening. See how moody you will be at supper time. You won't even have the luxury of thinking. Look at the whole question of African infrastructure or even the African air industry. Why is it that Africa is not growing? The only profit-making airline in Africa is Ethiopian airline. The only one. All the rest are loss-making. And the reason is because Ethiopians immunize the airline from corruption. Immunize, and I'm not saying it's total immunity, but they have demonstrated, even during the Degg regime, when there was problems with the, re with the regime of Mengistu Hail Mariam, Ethiopian Ireland shifted its hub to Nairobi because they know that that is a natural resource. When you have a goose that lays the golden egg, you don't kill the goose so that you can get the eggs in advance. No, you feed the goose so that it continues to lay eggs in perpetuity. And I'm suggesting to us that the African free trade area will only make sense. We are now talking about African free trade area. But you see, let us be realistic. You know, it's good to have pronouncements. I was in Nigeria the other day, and I said I was very happy with the African free trade area. I was very happy with ECOWAS because by the year 2020, they are going to have the ECO called currency. But I told them there will be no currency called ECO in January 2020. Why? Because it is unrealistic. In order to have the currency called eco, you need a minimum of 10 years. Why? Because you are going to bring in countries that are different economies with CFA Franc, with Naira, with Delassi and all those, but a good movement in the right direction. And you can only do that when you remove corruption. So that between the border of Nigeria and Benin, 
there are no tariff and non-tariff barriers and informal taxes. That between the border of Ghana and Burkina Faso, between the border of Nigeria and Cameroon, between the border of Sierra Leone and Liberia and Guinea and Guinea-Bissau, you don't have those impediments. And that if you go down in Sadak, between the border of Namibia and Angola and Malawi and Zambia and Lesotho and Eswatini, those borders begin to dissolve. And therefore you have, a, and that can only happen when we have reduced corruption and we have free movement of goods and services. Today, if I wanted to haul goods from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia to Dakar in Senegal, it would take two months. If I wanted to move by road, why? Why would it take two months? Because as I move from Addis Ababa, there is the danger of Al-Shabaab on northern Kenya. As I move, when I go into Burundi, there, there is the danger of Intaharamwe. And as I move in Congo, I'll stay there in the forest for two months. And when I move to Central African Republic, I'll have Antabaleka and Seleka. And when I move, I'll meet Boko Haram. You can't move that way. Meanwhile, the Chinese are moving goods from Beijing to Pakistan, from Shenzhen to India. These are the things that happen when we are talking about the impact of corruption. In the area of foreign direct investment, we must also ask ourselves what is the benefit of foreign direct investment and what is the transfer of knowledge. Because otherwise, the Chinese, I like them for one thing. They know what they want. <laughs> I was listening, and this is the last point I want to make. I was listening two years ago to the Chinese General Assembly, 6,000 men and women sitting in Beijing. And they were planning how they were going to deal with the world in the area of trade. And they were already thinking about how they will deal with Africa and the world a hundred years from that day. None of them will be alive by that time. None of them. But they are thinking that far. When recently the American president was attacking Huawei, and they said that the operating systems of Android would be taken away from them, within one month Huawei now has an operating system. Today, if you are to take away technology, if MTN and Orange and Vodafone and all these uh, mobile telephony companies were to migrate from Africa, tell me which African mobile telephony would we'll go back to the Stone Age. <laughs> the Chinese know what they want, and therefore when you see them here, their government can account for almost 9 out of 10 Chinese that are present in your country. And they are getting support. If you ask many African countries, what do you want? We live like is stated in the Bible. And what does the Bible say? Do not worry about tomorrow, because today has enough problems. That, we cannot continue to live like that. Because the Bible also says that you must keep for your children up to the fourth generation. So we must read the Bible in context, this idea that the Bible says that even the Son of Man did not have a place to place his head, and even the flowers of the field do not make any clothes, but they dress more splendidly than King Solomon. You must make clothes. There is no manna. The kitchen that was making manna in heaven was closed. So I'm submitting to us as I conclude that corruption is indeed a cancer in our body politic. It manifests in a negative way in the manner in which we see if our infrastructure is poor is because of corruption. If we don't have medicine in our hospitals is because of corruption. If we do not have research funds in our education system, if we do not have books for our young men and women is because of corruption. If you see our young men and women dying in the Sahara Desert and crossing the Mediterranean Sea to go and be humiliated in Europe is because of corruption. You men and women whom God has given the honor and privilege of serving in the labor movement, you have a duty which is multi-pronged. Number one, make sure that labor is treated well because human resource is the greatest resource on earth. Two, make sure that you are constant threat to the government by pricking their conscience. But when you talk to the government, remember you must talk to them 
in the manner and with the firmness that opens their eyes and opens their conscience, not with the arrogance that inflames their anger. And I, have a, I believe that when you do that, you will ensure that corruption has the chance of a snowball in hell and Africa will realize her potential and her potential is great. God bless you.